It's a movie about evil that begins with a picnic. In Oscar winner Zone of Interest, multitudes are gassed while Nazis wear the loot. Crematorium design is discussed as a triumph of engineering. Children at bedtime play with gold teeth. Trainloads of victims are herded to their death, while Hedvig, the commandant's wife, demands to stay at Auschwitz because here she has built a life. These paradoxes are the heart of the film. The director, Jonathan Glazer, has said this about Zone of Interest. We talked very early on about that there were two films at play, one the, the one you see and the one you hear. We have two films here. Film one, you see and you watch a family at play. Film two, you hear and it's hell on earth. And between the two lies a wall, just a wall, separates unconscionable horrors from life as normal. And Zone of Interest wants to do everything to make you see the imminence, the presence, the reality of that contradiction. It's all shot on fixed and hidden cameras throughout the house, a house which they refurbished specially for the film. This was shot on location at Auschwitz as though it was happening today. There's no sepia-toned color grade, there's no cinematic lighting. It was shot as a fly-on-the-wall documentary, bringing the reality of their contradiction to us. This is our world, the film is saying. We live with a wall. We present to our sight the world that we want to see, but behind the wall there is horror. There is something that you claim not to know, but you know. However you tune it out, it's there. Evil. Someone who was behind that wall at Auschwitz was Primo Levi, an Italian Jew who wrote many books about his time in Auschwitz, including If This Is A Man. He writes about what... The Nazis knew. It is true that the great mass of Germans remained unaware of the most atrocious details of what happened later on in the camps. But then he writes, most Germans did not know because they didn't want to know. Because indeed they wanted not to know. It is certainly true that state terrorism is a very strong weapon, very difficult to resist. But it is also true that the German people as a whole did not even try to resist. In Hitler's Germany, a particular code was widespread. Those who knew did not talk. Those who did not know did not ask questions. Those who did ask questions received no answers. In this way, the typical German citizen won and defended his ignorance, which seemed to him sufficient justification for his adherence to Nazism. The film depicts this powerfully. On this side of the wall, you fill your gaze with a beautiful garden and a play area. But later in the film, you come to see, how does your garden grow? What is your fertilizer, Hedvig? It's the ashes of the dead giving life to your dream. And when the children play, they play at gas chambers. The stronger child making a hissing noise while the younger cries out. It's often said of this film that you never see the evil, you only hear it, you only infer it from the sounds and the plumes of smoke that are coming from over the wall. But is that true? I mean, we do see evil in this film, don't we? Because what is evil? Who is evil? And is there any wall on earth that can hem it in? Is there any vision so captivating that it can distract us from true evil? The actor playing the camp commandant, Rudolf Hoss, describes what it was like to play this embodiment of evil and then to see himself on screen as Hoss. And sometimes uh, I was afraid to see myself in in the situation, not Rudolf. But I can say, okay, this is Rudolf. But yesterday I watched the movie for the second time and I feel very uncomfortable um, because some of the situations... Um, I was thinking, okay, that, that was me sometimes, and it, it frightens me. It's not something you can so easily distinguish yourself from, and that's at the heart of the movie. Other Holocaust movies have gotten us to identify with the victims. Jonathan Glazer wants us to do something else. The central principle was to show our similarities to the perpetrators um, rather than our similarities to the victims. And, um, and the discomfort of that, and the warning of that. And you ask, are we perpetrators? Perpetrators of what? Of evil? What is evil? Who is evil? The only person who seems to go on any moral journey in the film is the camp commandant's mother-in-law. To begin with, she praises her daughter Hedvig for having succeeded in life. There is a big house. There is a lovely garden. Then one night, a horrifying ash storm swirls around them. 
And as she takes in the washing, she looks over the wall and a reality that she had been suppressing comes crashing through. She's gone by the morning, leaving only a letter, which her daughter reads and then burns. If you are going to incinerate people, you will also need to incinerate the truth. What is evil? Who is evil? Not us, surely. But when revelation of our evil appears, don't we do what Hedvig did? Do we welcome the revelation of our evil? Do we heed it? Or do we silence and destroy it? You know that famous Mitchell and Webb sketch about Nazis waking up to their evil? Are we the baddies? Are we the baddies? That's a comedy sketch because it's absurd. Because that doesn't happen. You don't wake up one day and think of yourself as a bad guy. Even if you're Hedvig Hoss. Even if you're Rudolf Hoss. I mean, at the end, we get the idea that he's struggling with stomach issues, even though the physician gives him a clean bill of health. So why is he dry retching on the stairs? Because reality is crashing in on him from all sides. The wall can't keep it out. Antacids can't keep it down. Reality is reality, and that crumbling wall will one day fall. And then what? Hoss looks down the corridor towards the camera, towards the future. And the film cuts to the modern day in which Auschwitz is now a museum, commemorating the victims and exposing Hoss's evil. In this film, the future is the judge. And the future is unsparing in its assessment of Rudolf Hoss. You can do the Auschwitz tour today, as I've done, and you finish by seeing the spot where Hoss was hanged for his evil. And if all you saw were those photos, you'd think, there is evil, right there, hanging for his crimes, while I stand over here. But Zone of Interest is here to say, it's not so clean cut, is it? I remember the Auschwitz tour. I've been into the rooms that they showed at the end of Zone of Interest. This one is called Exploiting the Corpses. It's the one place at Auschwitz they do not let you take photographs. And the film does not show you one side of the room because behind glass you can see two tons of human hair on display. The film shows shoes and suitcases and glasses, but not hair. Hair is human remains. But that didn't stop the Nazis exploiting even that as a resource, selling on the hair for profit while they gassed and burned these men, women and children in their millions. But as I walked around the room called Exploiting the Corpses, two sentences just burst out of me. I semi-whispered them with each breath and I couldn't stop myself. The first phrase was, you bastards, you bastards, you bastards, you bastards. But hot on the heels of that was another phrase, and I didn't plan on saying it, it just came out of me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Over and over again, those thoughts returned to me. There was the outrage of the pointed finger. There was also the remorse of the contrite heart. Somehow, I'm sorry seemed appropriate. And I spoke to others on the tour. They felt the same way, like somehow we were complicit, like somehow we had something to say sorry for. I'm not a Nazi. I wasn't Rudolf Hoss or Hedvig or their children who play gas chambers and use extractive teeth as bedtime toys. I, but somehow, I'm sorry comes flying out of me. I feel complicit in this. I feel like I need to apologize. Why? What am I like? What are we like? And that's the second question that Zone of Interest opens up for me. First of all, we've asked, what is evil? And I think we can see there's something bigger than just individuals and their choices. And there's something baked in to evil in all of us, not just the hosses of the world. What is evil? It's bigger than we think. It's more baked in than we think. But then there's a second question. What is humanity? What is humanity? Humanity is a phrase that crops up a lot when you think about the Holocaust. I've already quoted from Primo Levi's book, If This Is a Man. Um, that's actually the name of the poem that begins his book. It's worth reading in full because, in a sense, Zone of Interest is the dramatization of this poem. You who live safe in your warm houses, you who find returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man. 
who works in the mud, who does not know peace, who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of a yes or a no. Consider if this is a woman, without hair and without name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold like a frog in winter. Meditate that this came about. I commend these words to you. Carve them in your hearts. At home, in the street, going to bed, rising, repeat them to your children. Or may your house fall apart. May illness impede you. May your children turn their faces from you. Primo Levi is urging us to see the humanity of the concentration camp victim. He wants us to see over the wall and to see people who are as worthy of our attention and protection as those on this side of the wall. But that's difficult to do when you've built the wall. It's difficult to do when you've dehumanized them so much. You live safe in your warm house. How do you see their humanity? And why should you see their humanity if you're a Nazi? The whole point of the wall is to divide. On this side of the wall, everyone is a precious flower. On the other side of the wall lies your fertilizer. That's how Nazis think. You see it in the movie, that they think of other humans merely as resources to be exploited or infections to be eradicated. Hedvig Hoss tries on the dresses of the dead. She smears on their lipstick. She talks to her girlfriends about how to get better loot. At the same time, the engineers talk about a more efficient crematorium around which you can move the pieces. Not people. The Jews were pieces to be moved around and disposed of. That's how Nazis think. According to Rudolf Haas's biographer Martin Brosat, Nazi ideology was catch-all, a conglomeration, a hodgepodge. Its racial component, writes another commentator, John J. Hughes, was consistent and, in every sense of the word, simple. This theory was rooted not in revelation, like the Catholicism Haas learned from his father, but in nature. All of nature, plants, animals, humanity was engaged in perpetual struggle. Only the strong survived. Humanity's strong races must dominate the weaker ones, therefore, and keep themselves racially pure. Admixture of blood with weaker races was fatal. So what is humanity? Rudolf Hoss's hero, Heinrich Himmler, said, Man is but a part of this world. Primo Levi is shrieking, am I not a man? But Nazis would say, yeah, sure, you're a man, so what? As Joseph Goebbels has said, certainly the Jew is also a man, but the flea is also an animal. You don't mind swatting fleas, do you? You might even call in the exterminator. That's the chilling simplicity of the Nazi view. But it's consistent. If man is but a part of this world. And to the Nazis, if you make sacrifices for those on this side of the wall, in order to compete with those on the other side of the wall, that is virtuous. And protecting human rights and valuing everybody across the other side of the wall would be considered selfish. As selfish as allowing an infestation of fleas to afflict your children's bedroom. Like I say, this is an abhorrent view. But we need to ask, why is it abhorrent? It's abhorrent because we all assume a very different view of humanity. A biblical view, actually. And in the absence of that biblical view, humans are not so special. And Nazism opens up to us. T.S. Eliot observed, If you remove from the word human all that the belief in the supernatural has given to man, you can view him finally as no more than an extremely clever, adaptable, and mischievous little animal. It was no wonder that the Nazis vented their greatest rage against the Jews. The Jews were the bearers of the most ancient humanism. The Hebrew Bible was the original anti-fascist document, beginning on page one with humanity, given dignity as such, humanity, not just a part of the world, humanity set apart, dignified, sanctified, holy, humanity in God's image. It was a vision for humanity that the Nazis hated, and it was a vision that they managed to extinguish for a time from some of their victims. Elie Wiesel survived Rudolf Haas's Auschwitz, though none of his family did. He wrote one of the most devastating accounts of life on that side of the wall, called Night. 
In the original manuscript written in Yiddish, he wrote, In the beginning there was faith, which is childish, trust, which is vain, and illusion, which is dangerous. We believed in God, trusted in man, and lived with the illusion that every one of us has been entrusted with a sacred spark from the Shekinah's flame. The Shekinah is the glory cloud of God. It symbolizes the presence and blessing of God. That every one of us carries in his eyes and in his soul a reflection of God's image. That was the source, if not the cause, of all our ordeals. Uh, Do you hear the faith that Elie Wiesel once had? A faith in God and humanity. It's a faith in God and humanity that rises and falls together. The Bible taught him belief in God and man. That belief was devastated by his experience of Auschwitz. In a a famous line from Night, he recounts seeing three Jews being hanged and a fellow Jew cries out, Where is God? He says, For God's sake, where is God? And the answer kind of rises up silently in his heart. He is here. He is hanging on the gallows. Auschwitz devastated Wiesel's faith, both in God and in man. And the Nazis wanted it that way. The Nazis were setting aside the so-called Jewish fables of the Bible and remaking the world on decidedly different foundations. They wanted to sweep aside both God and man, that entire biblical vision. But it's those biblical foundations that gave us a belief in humanity in the first place. The origin of all our beliefs in the dignity and the inviolable worth of all humans is this biblical vision. Human rights was a language developed from this understanding. The idea expressed in the Declaration of Independence that all of us have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that's grounded in the idea that all are created equal and endowed by their creator with such rights. The concentration camps were liberated by troops fighting on the basis of the Atlantic Charter, which expressed faith in life, liberty, independence, and religious freedom, and in the preservation of human rights and justice. But by the time they got around to judging the evil of the Nazis, that faith in humanity had not merely been rocked, it had been fundamentally undermined. Hoss and other high-level Nazis were accused after the war of crimes against humanity. In other ages, they would be convicted of sins against God, but after World War II, those standards were deemed far too lofty or far too contested. After Auschwitz, it's not just Elie Wiesel who sees God as dead hanging on those gallows. There has been an institutional loss of faith too. The lawyers prosecuting war criminals brought the standard right down to earth. Crimes against humanity. But... What is humanity? Zone of interest makes us ask that question urgently. Is humanity picnicking by the river or designing gas chambers? Is humanity to be judged on this side of the wall or that? Because everyone's nice to folks who are on this side of the wall. And everyone is capable of genuine evil towards those on the other side. So what is humanity? Are we like a loving family or like Auschwitz guards carrying out orders? If we are so mixed, then what does a crime against humanity even mean? What kind of courtroom should we imagine? How can humanity be the standard as well as the victim, as well as the perpetrator, as well as the prosecutor and the judge and the jury and the executioner? This case should be thrown out of court. You cannot have someone who is both the judge and the accused and the prosecutor and the executioner. So we have to ask, what is this humanity that Haas violated? Where have we seen it? How can we know it? Are humans by nature anti-fascist? Where have we found such specimens? Where can we find a true humanity to make sense of all of this? Well, I'm a Christian, so let me tell you what I think. I think we find it the same place we find God. And you say, I thought God was dead. Elie Wiesel told us he was hanging on those gallows. No, I do think that's where you find God. Tortured to death by a brutal regime, shoved around like a piece. Dehumanized, exploited. 
The Christian vision is of a God who descends to the cross. You know, Primo Levi asks, what is a man? And, and Christians say supremely, that tortured, despised man is truest humanity. Elie Wiesel asks, where is God? And Christians say that tortured, despised God is truest divinity. And you might think, that makes no sense. And I'd say, the world in which the Holocaust happened is the thing that makes no sense. This picture of true man, true God, tortured to death on the cross, this is the story that makes sense of these depths. And maybe you say, it's crude or insensitive to give a Christian answer to Jewish questions, Jewish pain. And first of all, I don't think what I'm saying is an answer, but it might start to be a set of spectacles you can look through. And actually, what I'm saying to Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel and to Jonathan Glazer and anyone else listening in, I'm not trying to take God away from you. I'm trying to show you he's so much nearer than you think. He's revealed most truly in a suffering, murdered, dehumanized Jew. So there are some thoughts, not only about zone of interest, but also about evil and humanity and, and ultimately about God. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And if you want to explore more of this Christian vision for God and humanity, why not do 321? You can explore it now as a kind of Christianity 101. There are stunning animations and thoughtful illustrations, plenty of questions to get you thinking about some of the big issues we've discussed in this video. Go to 321course.com and see life according to Jesus. And why not subscribe so that we can see you again on the next one. I'm Glenn from Speak Life, and we like to see all things through the lens of Jesus. Thanks.